This episode of the show is brought to you from the Salesman.org HubSpot studio. On this week in sales, we're going to be taking a look at whether omni-channel is the future of B2B sales, how Gong might be wrong and how they might be data pandering. And Victor put that one in so Victor could take uh, all the, the pressure from Gong that's going to get thrown his way from this uh, conversation. And finally, we're going to be taking a look at how sales reps might be losing deals and a whole lot more. Victor Antonio, how is it going, sir? All is well, Will. I want, I want to tell you something, Will. Just so I can understand you better, or you okay. folks from across the pond better, I've signed up, subscribed, I should say, to BritBox. BritBox is a subscription where you can watch all these British shows. And so before we launch into this, I just need to get this out of the way. Okay. For example, can you explain to me what, what somebody says, hey, let's go get some chippy tea. What is chippy tea? So a chippy sells fish and chips. Okay. So um, uh, something you might buy at a chippy would be a chip balm. Are you familiar with this? No, no. I just heard chippy tea. And so chippy chip tea? tea would be fish and chips, uh, sausage and chips, uh, cod and chips, plates and chips, whatever it is. Or you might get a chip balm or a chip bap. Both of them are essentially chips in a massive bun. But what's the tea for? What's the tea then? Oh, tea what? is... Um, oh, I, I just assumed this was uh, unilateral. So we'd have breakfast, we'd have dinner, and then we'd have tea. Okay. Oh, so it's all combined. Chippy so, tea all together. So it'd be breakfast, lunch, tea. So if we were getting fish and chips at tea, we'd go to the chippy to get tea. If we were getting a lunch, it'd be a chippy lunch. Okay. <laughs> okay. Also, chippy. someone who works Just with wood tea. is called a chippy as well. I don't know if that translates. Okay. Okay. Here, here's another one. I okay. Sod. You call somebody a sod or you a get sod. frustrated, I think. Yeah. S-O-D. S-O-D. Sod. sod. Yes. Um, it just means you're... The equivalent of America would be, oh, you, you son of a bitch kind of thing. You okay. sod. But then sod can be used in other ways as well, in that it could be used as, oh, sod in heck, I've, I've screwed that up. Or, okay. uh, yeah, that's probably the other way it'd be used. Got it, got it. My, by the way, my favorite line so far that you guys continue to repeat is, don't be so daft. Daft. Yep. Yeah, don't be so daft. I did a <laughs> podcast um, this week that will go out in a, in a few weeks from now with Daniel Disney, um, The Social Selling Show. And we were talking about haters on LinkedIn, social media, and what you should do if uh, you experience this. And I've experienced this before. I'm sure you will have as well, just with the size of your YouTube channel. And one of the things, you may enjoy this, one of the, it's very, this is very British, one of the things I do when, so there's two things I do if, if someone comments uh, something nasty on a post. One, Grant Cardone showed, showed me this in, in an email years and years ago. I just offered some advice. And this is what he used to do. Clearly, he didn't comment on anything now. He didn't need to. But he would comment, thank you for the attention. So if someone's being absolutely horrible and nasty on you when you're, you're selling or you're doing whatever online, just uh, Grant Cardone's advice is just to say, hey, thank you for the attention. And then if they comment something else, thank you for the attention. And you just, you're just feeding the algorithm. It's getting more attention and the video or post is going to do better. What yeah. I tend to do is just say, you're a bit of a silly Billy. Okay. Because <laughs> there's no I'm comeback not, from that. Uh, I'm not using that one. I'm just not using that one. So I've had this before. We can talk this, about this off air because you might know the individual. So one threatened legal action against uh, Salesman.org, the company, because one of our, our sales assessment, we, we, I changed the name then just to stop any faffing, um, but used a similar name to what this individual calls uh, part of one of his training products, right? Or his organization mm -hmm. called it. Right. And he was sending me these emails. He started spamming me on LinkedIn. He tried to, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what's the word, disparage and, and talk absolute just shit about me, the company. And so every time he did it, I would just post underneath, oh, you're a silly Billy. You're a silly Billy. And then people would start commenting on top of that saying, oh, you're, you're a silly Billy. And then they would call me a silly Billy and other people getting silly Billies. Some of these posts went semi-viral on LinkedIn just because That's people funny. jumping on the chain, calling yeah. everyone else silly Billy because this idiot is trying to, uh, trying to th flex his muscles and, and, and threaten things that he couldn't have pulled off anyway. So there we go. There's another one for you, Victor. Uh, if someone's doing your head in and you want to be, uh, if you want to disarm John, them, call them a silly I, Billy. I, I, I've jotted that down. I don't <laughs> think I'll use it, but I've jotted it down. All right. <laughs> Right. Well, rather than those two being silly billies and not talking about anything to do with sales, let's jump into the news. And this is from Groove.co. The, the article's entitled, or the, the post entitled, 50% of B2B sales professionals saw their workloads increase during the pandemic, a new survey reveals. So there's a few points in here. Victor has... Victor thought he was being a clever. Victor was basically being a silly billy. He's added a section underneath, which I've already included in the top of this doc. And Victor clearly didn't read what I wrote. Okay, well, go ahead, read it. 
So I'm going to read it. 42% of respondents indicated that customer churn from organizations impacted by COVID-19 was the biggest challenge facing their revenue stream, uh, revenue team in 2021. Now, Victor, is this because more and more products are just going this SaaS model and so it's going to become more and more of an issue for everyone in 21, 22, 23? Or is it because when you're on that uh, recurring model, you can just go, okay, we need to cut costs, cut, subscription cut. We don't need to speak to someone. We don't need to do anything. We just click on the website. It's gone, it's gone, it's gone. And co right. companies have made it almost too easy for brands to just move away from them. I, I think what, and by the way, I think I missed it because I didn't see the part about the survey of 765 sales professionals. That's why I think I kind of added that when I was sure. looking at that. Uh, sorry about that. But anyway, so I think this is interesting because I, I think this is part of the cost cutting effort the knee-jerk reaction that people went through when the pandemic hit. And a lot of companies told me the same thing. My, my first phase was to let's reduce costs anywhere we can. And if a lot of these subscriptions were actually just, you know, coming up, as you say, in a SaaS model, yeah, they were being just canceled. Wait, did you cancel anything during the pandemic? Did you have a, a hunker oh, down moment? No, I didn't actually. I, I mean, I don't think I, I actually had a spend moment. I think I, we talked about this, how I just started building out the studio because I go, we got to do something. So I went the other way. Uh, so we didn't look at cost. I'm sure if I looked at subscriptions, I'd probably give them a second look if I really needed it. But I can't recall cutting, cutting anything significant as far as, you know, a subscription or anything sure. like that. Well, yeah. I'm the reason I ask is I'm going to go through that the process over the next couple of weeks. So we spend like thousands a month on different subscriptions. And mm. some of them are completely needed because our developers need tools. Our, uh, uh, our editors need tools. I need software hosting. We host our own podcast feed. So that's like $100 a month to host that because so many people get, uh, get so much traffic every day. But I'm pretty confident I could probably slash this in half just because, and, and this will be relevant to a lot of organizations, it, it, I'm going to call it this. Maybe it's called this. Maybe it's called something else. But I feel like we get a subs subscription creep where we have oh, good five or six subscriptions. We're like, okay, fine. It's just, I don't even care about that money. It goes out. It's in the books. I'm not bothered. Then a year later, yeah. it's seven or eight. Three years later, we go, hey, we've not actually used any of these tools in 12 months. Do we really need them? And then maybe three or four years in, we go, oh, hey, we're, we're wasting thousands or tens of thousands of dollars a month on products and services that we were sold to uh, or sold out that we thought we were going to use, which we end up not using. And that's what we're facing over at sales.org at the moment, this, this subscription creep. Because we've got like three email services that our email lists are spread across mm -hmm. that could easily be combined into one email service. And that would save hundreds a month um, just on that. Yeah, I was thinking about I, as you're as you're talking. I'm going. The one that's irritating me right now is that to use the Vibe board, for example, behind me, I have to I use OneDrive, which is a Microsoft product, right? Uh, I started using Dropbox years ago, so I got so much in there, and then I got Google Drive because a lot of people don't like to use Dropbox; they have to use Google Drive. So I got three massive storage places. And it's hard to kind of say, everybody, hey, get on one platform. Maybe that's a new business model. The integration of hard drive space or cloud space, wouldn't that be an interesting model? That'd be an interesting model, I think. It'd be interesting, but I feel like you may be overcomplicating things by sending a link that then goes to multiple places and synchronizing it all when you can just, I guess, if you're the customer, you can demand what people use. And if you're the, uh, the, on the other end of things, maybe we've just got to suck it up. Here's, here's what I think. Here, here's kind of how I'm looking at it. And I'll give you a model. Tell me if you agree. I'm going I'm to shift it for you a little bit. Maybe you'll see it. There, there's a website called Chartable. And in Chartable, you can actually create a link for your podcast. And it can sense slash detect what a device the person is using. So much like that, what if you log into this massive cloud thing, whatever it is. Let's call it massive cloud, right? We log into massive cloud, The Victor right? cloud. The Victor Cloud, thank you. Oh, I like that. Let's go. They go, log into the Victor Cloud, and then you provide your logins for all your massive, your, your other, your subclouds. And then when somebody logs in or you send a link, you know, it knows which cloud to direct it, which subcloud to go in. So you're only working with one link, looking at three subclouds within the Victor Cloud. But then you've got to have, you've not solved the problem because you've got three subscriptions. Now you need the fourth subscription to combine all the subscriptions. <laughs> but, but okay, okay, let's go one step further. Let's really develop this product here. What if, the Victor Cloud can actually pull all three of the databases into a massive cloud, which will then allow you to cancel all your, at least all three. You could cancel all three. That would be an idea. You log in with all three accounts. The Victor Cloud would suck all the stuff in, organize it for you, and then say, you are now ready to cancel all your subscriptions. What do you think of that? 
I, I, th- I think all of those services probably have an export option to allow you to do that. They probably do. They yeah. probably do. So I was trying to be creative, but apparently you're not letting me today. So thank you for I'll, I'll, let, you, I'll let you run wild, Victor, when the ideas are terrible. I've got three subscriptions. I want to get rid of them. I'm going to start a fourth <laughs> subscription that will get all three subscriptions, combine them into one subscription, but now it's got three times the product service, so it's going to cost more. So you're, you're saying in, in, in the sun that you don't like my idea. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying just get on Google Drive and cancel the others. Yeah, I just start exporting everything else. Yeah, mm-hmm. but this one, for example, I have to use the OneDrive. Okay, it won't let me use the other drives but for some reason. That it's is limited. that. Will, so that's a product problem then, as opposed to a service problem, right? That is a writing to a manufacturer and getting giving them some feedback, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, even like if you, for example, if you go to Google Jam, which is a competitor of this board, mm-hmm. the Google Jam board is a Google product, and they want you oh. to use their product. So anyway, let's get back to. It. Well, let's move on to McKinsey. McKinsey Research confirms, and this is kind of what we're talking about here, an omni-channel is leading the approach to B2B sales effectiveness. And it's jumped from something that isn't in the title to 83%. So we'll come back to that in a second. So with, so I guess we need to clarify a few things here first. Victor, how, how would you describe omni-channel for someone listening to the show who's unfamiliar with it? To me, omni-channel is simply you have multiple ways to get to your customer or approach your customer. Pick your channel. These are the different channels you have. You have social media. We know what that is. Text, messaging, phone. What am I missing? You can send them a video, uh, email. So any which way you can. I mean, this isn't anything new. I think the numbers that have jumped significantly is a realization that, you know what? There's more than one way to communicate. My my question to you is, do you think this this jump is also this this ramp up, Will, is because of what we talked about last week as baby boomers exit the market? Mm -hmm. And we have more millennials in the market. They're kind of liking the whole omni-channel approach. They're more willing to go to the other channels to yeah, communicate. I totally agree. You're spot on. I think there's another layer to this as well, which this uh, research doesn't overtly talk about, but we talk about it on the show all the time, of where salespeople are engaging with buyers within the um, the buying cycle, the buying experience. Omni-channel, if we look at it from a broader perspective of uh, marketing, sales, and customer success, but whilst you're cold calling people, emailing them, engaging with them on LinkedIn, hopefully your marketing team is doing targeted advertising uh, mm-hmm. of from a brand perspective to that individual. Maybe there is conferences, events, even if they are virtual, that the individual has been targeted to as well. So I think what the research here is alluding to is the fact that you might have had at some point in time the ability to, we have one call, uh, one call center. All they do is cold call all day and they crush it. They've got the right uh, mm-hmm. the right method to get them right in front of the right people at the right time. And our product is differentiated enough that people go, oh, that is interesting. I'll, 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 take, a, I'll take your call. I'll have a listen to your pitch. Versus now, products are so undifferentiated and so similar that people go, well, okay, that sounds interesting. I'll just Google it and I'll get back to you. So in which case, you need to be at the top of the Google search any results via SEO or advertising within Google. You need to then, uh, when people click your LinkedIn profile, you need to have a great LinkedIn profile uh, before they engage with you. So I think this is what it's alluding to here of, it's not just, not for everyone. There'll be some companies that are still succeeding in this, but for most salespeople, most sales engines or machines, we're getting to the point now where you can't just cold call, cold email, meet people at conferences, networking. There's got to be a strategic approach to doing this as an as an account, attack the whole account as opposed to just get in front of the right people. I think, you know, I'm thinking about the change in the market. What you said is, as you say, spot on. I saw some data and, I, and we'll have to refer to it in the next, uh, this week in sales. The cold call to meeting ratio or percentage was like almost like less than 1%. Yep. And I found that like, I thought it was a little low, a little shocking that it was that low. I would have said three to 5%, but it seems that that number is dropping. As a, as engineers would say, it is asymptotically approaching nice. zero. You know, And I'm like, maybe, and that's why we're looking at other channels, but texting is up, right? Messaging is up in terms of connecting with people. So I think that's interesting. For sure. So, and this is what it's saying, right? If you can text someone, then then book a meeting to then do X, Y, Z, and then you get them on a webinar and you do this. Mm-hmm. By the time you get all these multiple touch points, by the time you do this omni-channel approach, you're not just influencing them at the 75% of the way through the buying cycle. Your brand has been through them, educated and taught them all the way through the buying cycle. And so at that point, if someone, if I've got all my information from Blackmagic, a producer of camera equipment, 
I'm mm-hmm. going to be more than likely to be swayed towards them because everything else is going to be compared against them. Oh, Black Magic does X, Y, Z because I watched this webinar. I spoke to a sales mm-hmm. rep. Um, someone called around and, and, and measured out the room or the studio or whatever it is to go with someone else. At that point, it's almost uh, seemingly a, a risk that you're not going to get what you've built yourself up to get. So I think this omni, omni-channel approach, it's going to be more and more difficult for smaller businesses to compete with the likes of uh, you know, if you're if you're buying cloud services or something like that, there's going to be very few startups that'll be able to compete with AWS or whoever it is, just because they've got that footprint and that brand recognition. And mm-hmm. I guess it's almost coming back round to the days of, you know, 40s, 50s, and 60s, where brands would become household names via just advertising on television because everybody would watch the television. I feel like there's more brands emerging now, like uh, all the internet brands: Google, Amazon, Facebook, LinkedIn. These kind of brands that have the brand recognition that like my, my dad knows what LinkedIn is. He's never been on there. He'll never go on there, but he knows what the product is just because of this omnichannel approach and so many people talking about it via, mm. I guess, network effects as well. I, I think it's interesting what you, what you just said is that because what you said, these are really mega brands, right? Yeah. And before we had brands and we had mega brands, and I think the brands are gone. They've been pushed down and these mega brands have become more mega, if I can say it that way. But everybody else is still amongst the noise trying to figure it out. Yeah, and it's been well studied that most of the mega brands of today, McDonald's, Coke, Nike, whoever it is, um, became, to use your words, Victor, mega brands because of TV advertising decades Mm -hmm. ago. And there was a lull um, kind of in the, in the past 20, 30 years until the internet age where I guess there's more there's more leverage there that you know Google, Facebook, these brands that really took off, they had more leverage than other brands had uh, prior to become that mega brand status. But yeah, most of the household names we know came from television 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Yeah, I think it's, a, and I just want to highlight this so we, and then we'll get back to this. But, but I think, and you tell me, I've noticed that even producing videos because, and we'll talk about video later on, maybe I should say it for that, but I'll just make a quick point. It's tougher to compete even with video today than it was, let's say, five, 10 years ago. And we'll hit that later when we talk about video. Sure. I, I will save right. my thoughts for that then because you were obviously a few, when did you start your YouTube channel? 2008, wow. 2009. When did what YouTube yeah. start? Uh, 2000, I don't know, but that was the year that uh, they were bought out by Google. And so, I remember, I, th- I think I told you, I read Gary yeah. Vaynerchuk's book, Crushing It, and he said, go video. So I went video. That's amazing. Because I read that book when it came out as well. But I don't, I definitely wasn't producing video. I think I might have been doing audio podcasts back then for a previous project, which was called The Upgraded Ape Show. Do you know about this? <laughs> oh, the Upgraded know? Ape Show? No, I don't know what that is. That thing, Victor, blew up. So I was super at the time interested in um, improving like mental performance, uh, even like smart drugs. Um, uh, physical performance. I was doing loads of um, uh, running half marathons at the time and trying to get competitive with that. I think uh, we lost Victor. We lost yeah, Victor man. again. We're only 20 minutes yeah. in. No, smart drugs. Okay, the upgraded ape. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. I'll have to check well, it out. I, I don't All know right. if it exists anymore. Um, okay. But if you look at our podcast feed now, if you look at the URLs for any of the podcasts, it's still libsyn.com forward slash yada yada upgraded ape forward slash whatever it is, because I kept the same podcast feed. So some of the content might be on there. In fact, there's a fella called, um, I, I'll have record, this show will go out, we record this show on a Thursday. It typically goes out on a Saturday morning. I'm recording with a chap called Stephen Kotler tomorrow. So I can say this because I'll have recorded the show with him before, uh, before he listens to this. He was the first, he doesn't know this yet, because you won't remember, he was the first ever interview I did like five, six years ago. So he is uh, runs a company that researches the flow state. Um, you may have come across him before. He's got he's got books on uh, kind of flow state and um, mental performance and more in like athlete, athletes. But it's applicable for salespeople. Salespeople have been in those situations where you're in a meeting, everything's going well, you're just flowing. Everything's coming out. Oh, you're quick. You, you, you're witty. Um, you, you're answering questions quicker and better than you ever usually would. And you're just in this flow state. So I'm, I'm having him back on to talk about that. But I interviewed oh. him. I was the first ever interview I did on the Upgraded Ape Show, which must have been like eight or nine years ago. And that was the project before uh, Salesman.org. Very cool. Who, who wrote the book? Remember there was a guy who wrote a book, The Flow. Flow. He had a complicated last name. Chichika Mezika Society. It was some Russian name that just went through a blender. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It was, it was a long name. But anyway, we'll, we'll put that in the show notes. But it was a good book. I remember reading that about the flow state and trying to achieve 
consistently a flow state and how you get into a flow state. So I think that's, by the way, I think that's a very important topic, by the way. So I, I'm with you on that. Okay. Well, we'll refer back to it next week and I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. see if there's any insights we can share with the audience. Cool. Next up, this is a Allego report. So we've, uh, they must be publishing quite a bit at the moment because we've featured them on This Week in Sales numerous times. And if you want to be featured on This Week in Sales, did you like that transition, Victor? If you want yeah, to be featured on This Week in Sales, head over to thisweekinsales.com, submit your article, post, data, whatever it is in there, or comments if you want to give me or Victor some banter, please do. So this is a new report from Aligo who says, or it's entitled, <laughs> more than half. What was funny about that? We just lost you. Read the, read the title, read the title, read the title. <laughs> More, I think we're building some suspense here with this title, Victor, and I don't think it's going to pay off. More than half of sales reps lost a sale because they couldn't meet a buyer in person. I mean, just I mean, just by the way, Adam, who does the editing for this podcast, I want Adam to drop in a boohoo baby <laughs> crying sound right here, like <laughs> wah, wah, wah. More than half of sales rep lost a sale because wah. They couldn't meet with buyers in person. Wah. Such hold, a white title. On, that Victor. is a white title. This is not no. an opinion. This is a data point right there. You're adding the emotion to this. Okay, I, I'm going to tell you why. Why this is a what? But just go ahead. Just read. Just read the data. I don't want to talk about. It. Go so, ahead. Read so it. I'll give you. I'll give you a few bullet points. Going remote right. has hurt productivity and morale. This is what I thought was the most in, uh, valuable thing about this because we, we all were in the assumption that working from home is great. Everybody's happy. People are spending more time with their, their family, their dogs, or whatever it is. But sixty-two percent of sales professionals say they'd lost a sale because they couldn't meet uh, personally with a buyer. 56% of sales leaders say remote work has negatively affected team culture. And 57% of sales reps say they feel unmotivated working remotely during COVID-19. And I would be in that bucket, Victor, if I was, especially medical device sales, which the whole point is you go into the operating room, you spend time with these awesome surgeons, you're learning every time you go in. I'm trying to teach, but I'm learning at the same time. If I was just sat at home sending out flyers, Demo, doing equipment via Zoom, whatever I would have been doing in medical device sales, I would have felt demotivated as well, I think. What about you? Yeah. By the way, there, there's parts of this I really agree with. And I, let, me, let me rephrase that. There's a lot of this report I agree with. <laughs> the part that made me just call it a whiny title was that title. 62% of sales professionals say they lost a the sale. Okay, they, because they couldn't meet with the buyer personally. Okay, so where did the sale go? Where did the sale go? I guess to another person who knew how to use virtual selling more effectively because they couldn't meet with you. They couldn't meet with anybody else, but they also bought from somebody else. That's the assumption is that that when I read that, I go, well, wait a minute, who did they buy from? If they didn't buy from you, they bought from somebody. And if they couldn't meet, they probably bought virtually from somebody. So that's why I gave this the whiny award <laughs> of the week. <laughs> well, the whiny uh, title. Yeah, there it is. But, but to your point. Okay. So, so, so we don't beat that one to death. I, am I was just, can I just beat people. it to death a little bit more before we continue? Okay, go ahead, go ahead, beat the horse, beat the horse. Be ahead. Because as you say that, Victor, I doubt that these are including buyer interviews after the fact, right? This is a salesperson who's being um, surveyed who said, yes, I have lost a, have you lost a sale because of not being able to meet in person? Like 50% of them, yes, 50 or 40% of them, no. They're not asking the buyers whether the sale was lost because the individual couldn't mm -hmm. come in. And so... Of course, you're going to think that you've lost stuff, but thinking isn't the same as you know, that actually, the truth. That, that reasoning right there made this sound even whinier, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> See, we, we both just agreed on something, Victor. You, you made yeah. a point, and I'm, I'm back to you all, my friend. <laughs> Appreciate that. But but, but I, I, I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday. This goes to your, the 56% 50, of sales leaders says remote working has negatively affected team culture and sales reps that they felt unmotivated working during COVID. That is true. I believe that to be true. But the one, the example that brought it home for me was the conversation I had yesterday with a friend of mine. I said, how's business going? He says, man, he says, we're struggling to keep people. We have, you know, people are quitting. And I said, why? And I thought he was just going to say, well, you know, something about the work environment. But he said, no, he says, we don't pay people a, a competitive rate. We're usually a little like five or 10% below the competitive rate. But the reason people came to work with this company and stayed is because they loved the culture. And then COVID has basically decimated that corporate culture. And I thought that was a fascinating perspective. 
It is, but there's plenty of uh, like, um, is it Basecamp? The founders of Basecamp have written a number of mm-hmm. books on remote working. Like when I was in sales, like 10 years ago, I was reading their books on this. So it is possible to build a great culture in a remote workforce as well. You know, it, it can go, you could, you could, you could pivot the culture and, uh, and, and make it appropriate and enjoyable both sides, right? I agree. It's a tougher, you know, like we, we keep forgetting that virtual selling is a new skill set that we have to learn, that it's not a switch you just turn out and become good at. You know, you and I are comfortable with video because we've done video for a while. Sure. But there's a lot of people who are just technophobes. They don't even want to get on video. I had a training session yesterday and trust me, I saw it in full effect. So just like that, it's not easy to turn on the switch. I think culture is even, yeah, you could do it remotely. But you better have a very special manager or a leadership that can be able to translate that into a virtual setting. And I think that's the hat trick, Will. Sure. And there's a data point here from this article, oh, from this report, sorry, from Aligo.com. And we'll link to all of this in the show notes over at thisweekinsales.com. And uh, alluding to the point that you're making here, Victor, 49% of sales reps hired since COVID-19 say that they haven't been coached well enough on virtual selling to succeed. So people are feeling this uh, both from, a, I guess, a managerial level when culture has been mm-hmm. shattered and people working from home and perhaps salespeople feel like they're not getting enough support, which we've covered on the show before. Maybe there's a level of accountability that people need to take as well as uh, assuming support from their organization. Um, but, you know, if you feel like you're being unsupported, that's that's your thoughts and opinions, isn't it? Yeah. What do you think of the, you know, the, the statement, it takes two times longer for a new hire to be productive during the pandemic compared to when they were doing in-person training. What are your thoughts on that? I guess if you if you're if you're being onboarded, which can take you know six months, twelve months. I know in my last last medical device sales role, we were literally learning the best we could at a uh, layperson esque level the procedures, so we know when our endoscopes would be used, when the cameras would be used, that side of things. Mm-hmm. You, we literally went to almost like college for six months, and then six months of being with someone in the field and and mm-hmm. and following them around and being out uh, learning from them. So it took a good twelve months to ramp people up. So if you've got to do, if you're trending to do that and you can't go out mm. in the field, you can't engage with your peers and perhaps these are some organizations haven't set up the sales enablement tools with, because it's easy to buy a tool, which we covered last week as well. It's easy to buy a sales enablement tool, get it on the books, so to speak. But then you've got to populate it with content that's relevant for your sales process, your customers, your team, uh, culture, all that kind of stuff as well. So maybe it's taken a year, maybe it's taken this long just to get all those tools in place. And so people have been uh, kind of scruffy and scrappy mm-hmm. about that onboarding process in the meantime. So maybe that will kind of shrink now that hopefully organizations have got some of this sorted. But that could be why it's taking, uh, what does it say, taking twice as long. It could be just because we didn't have the things in the systems in place to do the, all of this remotely. Oh, I agree. I think that's a great point that, you know, there's a lot of delivery systems, sales enablement, you know, platforms. But as you say, the content piece, a lot of these, I don't want to generalize. I always do that. So I'm pulling back on my generalization. Too many companies that I know, when I ask them, what do you have for, let's say, in our case, a sales training program and how robust is it? I mean, I've gotten people to send me maybe five pages. Mm -hmm. This is our whole sales training program you're like that's it no online learning management system nothing and there's no content and so i think a lot of people got caught with their content pants down and now they're trying to you know figure out how do you do that i think that's the problem so it's content it's the it's the delivery system it's the content and then we slap coaching on top of that if you have all those three i think you can ramp up much faster for sure. And there's tools, I won't <laughs> name any because uh, there's loads in the marketplace, but yep. you can Google sales onboarding tool or sales enablement onboarding. And a lot of this is in place. And I know some of them, because I might be working with one brand who they will coach you into creating the content as a layer of value that they offer to their customers. They're one of the most expensive brands in this space, but they will, as I said, coach you into creating the content as opposed to going, hey, Upload photos, videos, text here, and we'll see you when we need to renew in it 12 months' time. Mm-hmm. I love that. I love that. All right, let's talk video. I thought this was interesting. Now, this is not a shocker. This is nothing outside of the box like, whoa, let's stop the whole show and just talk about this. But what's behind it is interesting. I want to get your feedback. Vidyard, this is off of uh, Valdos Valdosta Daily Times. That's a little 
probably south here of Atlanta, Georgia, Valdosta. Remind me to tell you my pancake story in the <laughs> south one day. Anyway, so Vidyard launches desktop apps as adoption of user-generated videos in sales accelerates. What do you think of the title so far? Vidyard launches desktop apps as adoption of user-generated videos in sales accelerates. I think two things before we get into the article. One, Vidyard should reach out and be sponsoring both all of mine and all of your content. Because They should, actually. They'd um, be smart if they wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so that's, that's one thing. And me and you can talk about it off air of a potential hurdle to that. So Vidyard, do reach out to myself and Victor directly, please, if you want to get involved and get in front of our audience. The other thing is, I've got a Wistia t-shirt on who are a direct competitor to a Vidyard. <laughs> I just really enjoyed, they, they sponsored the show a few years ago. I really enjoy this t-shirt. I think it's cool. So I did not wear this for this occasion. Uh, but big shout out to Wistia on the Soapbox product. But shout this, out to Wistia. But this is Good what's pro- coming, right? Um, it's it's one thing to, and I've, I've, I've pondered over this with our training product over at Selden.org as well. Does it have to be in the browser? Could we do a, a software product that essentially pulls from the browser but caches it or saves it all on your computer as well? So it's it's rapid, it's fast. It seems like some of what they're doing here it will be from a technology perspective. You don't have to go through your Chrome browser. If there's an update with the browser that just wrecks all uh, video access through the through the kind of I guess APIs and, and pathways there. It doesn't affect you. There's different uh, product cycles. You can probably do different things at a deeper level. On, on Windows and, and Mac OS if you've got your own application as opposed to piggybacking on something else. So this is clearly going to come because clearly we're all using products like Vidyard, like uh, Wistia Soapbox product all of the time. I know I, I know I do a lot more video emails using both of these services uh, regularly now, more than I ever have done. And some of it, Victor, is just convenience. Sometimes I want to yeah. share something that's somewhat complicated and I'll do it and I don't think we'll be able to see, but I've got now a the iPad set up with the my computer and I'll do it from here. So it's like I'm pitching a sponsor, something like that. I'll perhaps doodle stuff on the iPad. I'll just give a, a 30 second, 40 second conversation, conversation starter point. And those videos are doing really well as opposed to just kind of webcam uh, stuck in face. And so if I'm doing mm-hmm. this, I'm sure the marketplace are doing it and anything that makes it more seamless, anything that perhaps can add more features to the experience over time um, is great. And so Vidyard are clearly doing great work here. Yeah, and you know, you've had your you know, your branding together for many years now. You're like ahead of the curve. And I think in a couple of years, everybody's going to be doing what we're doing. Mm-hmm. And probably, you know, so we, we need to level up. But I think this is interesting. Let me read the article here real quick. As more businesses, businesses embrace the shift to remote work and reduce travel, a growing number of sales teams are turning to user-generated videos to connect with customers and share ideas where they can't be there in person. I think that's the challenge, getting salespeople to use it. To support this growing need, Vidyard, again, now has these apps. I've never had a problem with the apps, but I, but I understand your concern that, especially like I just updated again the Mac platform. I don't know. Their new platform is something sore or something. Mm-hmm. And it takes like, I don't know, five hours to actually do that. Uh, so I, I love this. And my question to you is, and you've already kind of answered it, was is this reaching a level, sending videos, now reaching a level where it's right there with email? Or you can actually go, hmm, email, video. Where a couple of years ago, you're like, well, I ain't doing video. I'll just send them an email. Now I think it's almost like there. Do you feel that? I I appreciate the question. I think it's... Um... You know, when I'm about to be set up for a <laughs> kill, you always say, I appreciate the question, Victor. No, no, it's, I... almost, it's almost like the matador when he knows the bull <laughs> is tired. And then he raises his sword one last time, right above, aiming downward, and then waiting for the final kill. So go ahead. Do you know what? It wasn't that at all. What I was trying to do was pivot the question so I could answer something completely different, which is what I'm going to do. Because I feel like, uh, I don't feel like, I know, because we use it, and it's, it's, a, it's software-based, right? It's one of the zeros. Most of these videos are being sent over email. So you've still got to have the subject line. You've still got to have essentially a, a thumbnail. If you're using Google or wherever, you might have the image pop up uh, underneath the subject line before you click on it. So we're piggybacking on the existing technology of email. So you've got to be great at email regardless. And videos are a, a way to do email. Now, some of this changes when these tools can start to do it and when uh, service providers and carriers will allow you to do it, when you can send an email directly to someone's phone. So if I've got mm. your phone number, and we've both got iPhones, I can send you an iMessage or whatever the, the branding is, but a, a video message over iMessage. Now that's more direct. I don't need to rely on subject lines. The deliverability is going to be a hundred percent. Now you may choose not to open it, you may choose to block my number, but it'll mm-hmm. definitely reach your inbox. 
versus sending video over email. Who knows whether it ends up in spam or elsewhere? So in the to answer your, your question, email is important, but when video becomes slightly, I think we're perhaps a few years away, when when I want to message you rather than texting you, I just go, uh, hey, Victor, are you ready for the show? I'll, I'm jumping on. I'm just in the car. I'll be in the studio in five minutes. When I mm-hmm. when that becomes more and more common, that's when video perhaps will overtake email. And we see it with web mm-hmm. traffic, right? Um, most web traffic is video. More people watch mm-hmm. video than read articles. That that shift yeah. happened four, four or five years ago. So I agree. this this is coming more and more over time, and it will become more and more seamless. And eventually, Apple will really encourage video, but it's just more expensive to send. It's more expensive to host, and so there are physical bandwidth limitations that are perhaps holding back the technology just slightly right now. And and I think let's let's loop this back. Let's do a call back to our initial conversation about omni-channel, because again, what I think is happening is that. The younger generation, if I can say that, millennials and everybody after that, again, they're taking this like fish and water. They're not they're not having a problem with it, which is why you're seeing, I think, this increase in this usage. For sure. And, and what would you rather get, Victor? Would you rather get a video <clears throat> email from me? So I don't know, say like I <clears throat> say I want to pitch you on a new show. I, I really want Victor to work on the sales technology show, whatever it's going to be. Mm-hmm. Which would you be more likely to engage with and go, huh? A well-written five three hundred word email that lays everything out, or a video via email, which can still have bullet points and stuff at the bottom that summarizes mm-hmm. the where I perhaps show you something as opposed to just tell you about it. I, I like the way you phrase that because I, I think if you record a three hundred word page, you know, three hundred word article, if you record that, I think it is about a minute. And I want to highlight that I would go for the video if I saw a minute. You know, if I saw a minute and a half, I'd be like, okay, that's my outer bound of wanting sure. to watch the video. And anything after 90 seconds, I'm like, I don't know if I want to watch it. Because if you can't say it in 30 seconds or 60 seconds, it probably isn't that good. So it's going to force us to be very good at really getting to the point. For sure. And and a final point on this, yeah. I see this with LinkedIn uh, voice messages, which I get somewhat regularly at the moment. Mm-hmm. This seems about the hot topic, a hot mm-hmm. hack for people to do. And I, I feel like, because there's no thumbnail, because there's no title, people just send the message. I'm like, right, I've got to listen mm-hmm. to it because I might miss out on something important if I don't. Even if it's some mm. schmuck sending it me, um, maybe this, <laughs> maybe they picked up on a mistake on the, one of the podcast episodes. Maybe I've said something that I shouldn't have said. Maybe there's a, maybe something needs to be changed or they found an error. Of course, most of the time they're trying to pitch me products and services I'm never going to buy ever, and they're just spamming me. But there's an, I think there's an element to that of video where I'm probably going to check it out. I'm more likely to check it out than if you send me a big blog post. I'm just going to delete it if it's not relevant yeah. in the first three seconds. I, I think there's part, by the way, this is totally anecdotal. I got no proof for this one. But when we see a video thumbnail, there's a voyeuristic element in our mm-hmm. brain that just wants to see it. Do you know what I mean? It almost like, kind of makes you just want to look at it. Even if you know you're not going to want to like the pitch, you just want to want to say, well, let's see what they did. Let's see how they do it. You know, so I think that's that element in there. Anyway, leave us your feedback on what you think about, uh, you know, video versus email. What do you do? Give us some feedback and we'll talk about it on the show at thisweekinsales.com. Let's talk training well. You mentioned Brain Shark last week, and this one popped up on the news radar. Brain Shark announces new partnership with Enhanced Sales Training. See, this is going to let people know that we'll talk about other sales training programs. We don't have a problem with that. So anyway, Brainshark, the company's strategic partnership with Value Selling Associates, great company, and To Win. If you're familiar with the book uh, Demo to Win, this was founded by the uh, author of that book. Offer off-the-shelf content to complement Brainshark's industry-leading sales readiness platform. I like the way they're starting to use that more, sales readiness platform. BrainShark is leading, I mean, leading platform for data-driven sales readiness. Today announced its alignment. And I, I think the value selling associates, it's really focused on, I think it's more, again, I'm not gonna, I'm sure they got a lot of things, but their focus is a lot of B2B value-centric selling. How do you position the value? Where to win is really about how do you create and how do you do an effective demo? So I think there's a, these are nice additions, you know what I mean? I, I see these consolidations happening. And, you know, I think what will happen is one day, if it hasn't already happened to you, I'm hoping it happens to me big time, is that somebody says, Victor, we love your content. Will, we definitely love your content. We want to put you on a platform. Let's do a strategic partnership. And I think this is uh, it's a cool trend. What do you think? I, I love it. This is definitely going to happen. And then 
a brand like Brain Shark is going to go, oh, 90% of our customers are using this training that we're probably licensing as opposed to that we own the IP of. Let's just buy the consultancy that are doing it so that we own the IP. That is then a differentiator in the marketplace. Correct. Um, and we've talked about it off air before. There is a brand that wanted to license some of our content. And, I, and you, mm -hmm. you schooled me on this. And I said, no, I want to keep everything in-house. I think there's a level of exclusivity to that as opposed to seeing the content just spread out across the internet. And you went, Will. Bollocks. You stop being a silly Billy. <laughs> this brand has a massive audience. They're a well-known brand. You're already working with them. Get them, yeah. get it on there, because then you can say, "Hey, uh, this uh, this <clears throat> training content is well, essentially you could allude to this content is uh, licensed to X Y Z one two three one two three, and it, it improves the I guess social proof of the content itself, which is uh, we can talk about it off air. I'm we're working behind the scenes on some exclusive stuff for that brand. Very cool. Uh, I'm Very sure cool. the audience can guess who that brand is. Um, but yeah, okay. this this is definitely going to happen. We've talked about this on the show a bunch of times, yep. Victor. The, yep. These enablement companies are creating a stagnant, not stagnant, what's the word, a sterile tool. And it's, it's a hard slog to create content. You know this, I know this, to create a, a curriculum to cover what basis you think is appropriate, to even do research and data. So we're doing a, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it, but it, it won't be coming for a good few months yet. I'm going to start, a, well, I'm not, I, we, we've got a new person starting a new podcast called the buyer experience where we're going mm -hmm. to be doing customer interviews and asking the buyers uh, that we get on the show similar questions every episode uh, collating that data and then trying to understand the new bod the new modern buying journey so that we can then implement that uh, anything that they tell us that we should we shouldn't do we can implement that into our training and this mm -hmm. takes a ton of work ton of effort ton of resources and so when there are small organizations that the likes of brain shark brain shark could potentially gobble up that have done all the hard work for them, it makes total sense, right? Yeah, no, I, I love it. God, great minds think alike. So about uh, two weeks ago, I was re I was researching uh, the same thing. I was actually looking up a name for a podcast, and I literally had BX now, the BX podcast, nice. which is the Buyer Experience podcast, but somebody already grabbed it. So I think it's a great idea, but I, I never would have thought of using those interviews to extrapolate data. Yep. Brilliant move, man. Brilliant move. So we'll, Rarely we'll, did I say that. Rarely <laughs> did I say that about you. But brilliant idea. We'll, we'll see how it materializes because clearly th for, the, for the data to be valid, like survey data is not the best data. And we, we, we pile in on brands that do survey data and we pick holes in it. So... I need to have a think about how we can eliminate some of those holes from our own data. It's going to be survey-based. I know um, I was interviewing Tim, I think he's the CRO over at uh, Corporate Visions. And what mm -hmm. they do a lot of, which I think is fascinating, is mm -hmm. they'll do buyer simulations. So they'll have, I assume they've got their own software and they'll set a buyer in front of it. The buyer will see different pictures. They'll have essentially virtual conversations. And then they all act as if they would act in the real world and say, well, I probably would have bought this or that would have put me off. This would have this would have mm -hmm. done well. And so I feel like that is more accurate than just a survey alone because you're putting someone under a little bit of pressure there to respond how they would in real time in, in the real world. Um, but I, I love the research is definitely mm. uh, high on my uh, priority list of all this. But, and, and the reason is because it has value to these bigger brands that will want to get access to some of it. Yeah. I, by the way, I love corporate visions. Uh, I think it's Tim Reister. I yep. think that's how you say his name, Reister, who's over there. The way they're approaching that, the way you describe it, I really love that because, you know, if you ask somebody, why did you buy the product? Again, you're never going to get the real. But if you're interviewing them within that context, I think that's a brilliant idea. And speaking of brilliant ideas, let's talk about this brilliant report put out by Gong, which I'm just asking the question, well, could Gong be wrong? Love it. All right. So here's the title. This is, by the way, we've now entered the culture section of thisweekinsales.com. Anyway, here's the title. This article was written by Devin Reed, who you've interviewed, have you interviewed Devin Reed over at Gong? No, I've but I've him. listened to your interview of him, which is a great interview. Yeah, he's a I mean, love the guy. I mean, just great content, great know-how. I do watch some of his videos on some of the stuff he does uh, with his personal podcast, good content. He wrote this article, which I said, what? Let me look at this thing. So the article is titled on LinkedIn. We got the link in, uh, in the uh, show notes. Women are capitalized letter here, way better than men at this high value sales skill. And my question was, is Gong wrong? Maybe they're right. Let me look at this. This seems like Boy, it could I be a section. <laughs> this seems like a, a podcast. And it's, it's Gong wrong. 
I'm, go- I'm going in. I'm going in. Uh, Amit Bandoff, the CEO from Gong, will be calling me after this, but I'm going in. All right. Here's what he said in his article. Devin, he said, we analyzed 103,000, 104 rounding up, B2B sales calls to see if women and men, sales pros differ. My goal was to understand Freudian at best, what all sell- I inserted that, by the way, what all salespeople can learn from those differences. One glaring stat that popped out immediately was that women listen 16% more than men. Now, up to that point, I'm like, I'm good with this. I'm good with this. I'm like, yeah, this is probably true because from my personal experience, I know that to be a fact. How about you, Will? There's tons of data on that. Uh, whether we're looking at um, like uh, emotion, empathy versus uh, blokes' assertiveness and aggressiveness, there's there's plus and minuses on both sides when we look at the traits of sales, and it's it's all well researched. So up to this point, me and Devin, me and Gong, we're good. He even says, I mean, I love the fact that Devin clarified our research shows that men and women sell very similarly in plenty of ways. Now he we, we go into kumbaya moment here. We're all the same. Talk tracks, men and women, AEs, tend to cover very similar topics. With regard to questions, men and women, AEs, tend to ask a similar number of questions, clocking in at about 18 per call. Patience. Both men and women have near equal patience scores as measured by the time of silence by the end of the prospect's monologue and the beginning of the AE's next monologue. This is good so far. I'm with this so far. Well, language. They also use collaborative language. We, us, you know, with similar frequency. Emoticons, right? Men and women use emoticons with similar frequency, including them in about 2% of their emails. So I am good with all this, Will. But here is where Gong, I'm going to say it, Gong got it wrong. Let me go slowly because then I want you to tell me if I'm wrong. Okay. But I don't think so. <laughs> this is called, I believe the phrase is a syllogistic fallacy. But let me pull it back. What he said was, Women listen 16% more than men. That's what data shows, which is why they're winning more deals. Now, the women being good at selling is the correlation. The listening is the causation. This is what they don't slice thinly. In other words, it isn't that women are way better at selling. Women are way better at listening. So the key skill for any person to win or be better at selling It's not that you have to be, it's not gender centric. It's a skill set of listening. And that's why I think they got it wrong. Am I wrong, Will, or is Gog wrong? Go on the record. So I've just pulled up the post (laughs) because there's one thing I want to just confirm, right? Sure. And I think we can. So you said in your arguments here, I feel like we're in court, right? Your argument was that this article is suggesting or saying outright that women sell more than men because they listen more. Is that is that what you said? Is that fair? I am looking at the title. I am redirecting, Your Honor. I am redirecting. Said women are way better than men at this high value sales skill. So are they better at selling? Which exactly. Their- exactly. So what we need to know is out of this mix of individuals. Are the individuals who close more business, men, women, I guess it's almost irrelevant. Are the individual who close more business, people who listen more? And I don't think that is clear. Because if that's the case, then maybe the women in this study will have that slight advantage. If mm-hmm. that's not okay. the case, then it's all irrelevant and it's just trying to get clicks and, and it's pulling <laughs> you. It's, it's, <laughs> it's uh, put a bee in your bonnet for that reason. Yeah, that put me in my bonnet. But I, but, I, but I think it's one of those things where it has nothing to do with women. It has everything to do with the sales skill. And it, I, I, I rather they would have focused it on that. Be, but because it's International Women's Month is why I think they did. By the way, I came up with this phrase. They use data to pander, i.e. data pandering. That's why I came up with the phrase. I'm just on the post here. So it says top performers listen more than they speak on sales calls. Bottom reps talk 72% of the time and they listen 28% of the time. You know, top reps talk 48% of the time and listen 54% of the time. 
some of this is common sense. I could have probably asked you those percentages and you would have got, uh, you would have sussed them out. Well, now some of this doesn't pan out all that accurately. And the data, once it's all um, charted and put into, uh, we just don't have access to the raw data, right? So I can't comment mm -hmm. too much on it. But if top reps listen 54% of the time and the women in the study were listening for an additional 16%, then they wouldn't be the top reps. Listening more, uh, it could be at that point counterintuitive to sales success. So we don't, we need to know are these individuals, what, what we need to know, it's, it's relevant to listening. Are, are the women in the study more successful than the men? And it's probably 50-50, right? The, right. That, that's, right? That's an assumption from my side because um, maybe I'm pandering slightly here as well. But if we know that or we assume that, then it's irrelevant, uh, the talk time, because if I listened 100% of the time and I had 100% of this high value skill, it's going to be a weird <laughs> sales call when I'm sat there like, okay, let's go. That's funny. That's funny. Oh, that's funny. Go and, ahead. And the buyer's like, the buyer's like, uh, well, are you, you going to ask you, me any questions? The buyer's like, well, you called me, and I'm like, <laughs> high value skill. <laughs> Can't wait to buy that's that good. Porsche. Okay. Oh, I'm gonna get a new house on the back of this. Yeah. So, so th th okay. this is some of the problem. This is some of the problem. That I, I, as I said, I alluded to earlier. I'm facing with collecting data because you can make data say whatever you want. And I think we are doing a fair job with your background in engineering and then you know leadership, sales training, all that, um, to call out some of this data when it's seemingly useful, but we don't know uh, where it's come from, it how how it's <laughs> pitched. And I'm from my background in you know i've got undergraduate degree in chemistry all computational chemistry based um mm -hmm. you know i did loads of research and i was terrible at it but i understand the fundamentals and how to use the scientific method soundly and i think this is hopefully the audience i uh, think this as well this is a service that we're doing because any schmuck can do ask 100 people one thing or another and depending on how you ask the question depending on where you get the data mm -hmm. from whether it's your customer versus the actual marketplace you can skew all of this one way or another. And it's important, Victor, we're talking, and maybe this is a consideration for the audience as well. Everything we talk about on the show, most of the stuff, aside from the likes of the, the likes of Gartner, right, who perhaps mm -hmm. are less bound to product services, ideas, uh, and pushing a narrative, most of the content that we talk about is essentially marketing collateral for these brands the to company. get attention. Correct. We're buying into it. We're disseminating it. We're sharing it out. And, mm -hmm. and so we've we've got to be conscious of that. The audience have got to be conscious of that as well. So when we talk about these numbers, I think we do a reasonable job of saying, well, this, uh, there was a massive Salesforce study that we commented on like a few months ago. And, mm -hmm. and the Hub, recent HubSpot studies as well, um, they're not pushing an agenda. They're not spinning the data out so much, those two brands, and they're targeting a large audience of not just their customers, but people in the marketplace. And so the val validity of their data is, I'm, I'm sure Gong have tons of data from across multiple sure. industries and, and, and brands as well. Um, but we've got to just, uh, all I'm saying is we've got to be careful about when we talk about stuff. And if we just give you, uh, the audience listening right now, if we just give you a random number and we don't back it up with the fact of we trust some of this data, maybe you should be treating it, some of this as entertainment as well as uh, kind of what yeah. you want to base your career on. I, this, you know, the, the 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 second B in my bonnet with the article had nothing to do with the article. It had every, everything to do. If you go look at the look at the blog, I know you have it in front of you. Look at the blog. Look at the responses. They're like, oh, oh my god, women are awesome. See, I told you, women are awesome. Hold oh on. my god. Oh there's, my god. There's a response from Victor Antonio here, and I've got a hard I stop. Did, I've uh, got a hard stop, so I'm going to read Victor's response here. So this is publicly shared. Victor yeah. is is open to be uh, abused online via his response here. Victor says, yeah. I completely agree with Lauren Bailey. Gone are the days that sales means pushing. Correct. Selling is servicing at the heart, and listening is its lifeblood. That said, Devin, that's, that's said, my friend. <laughs> that's, said, that's said, Devin. It would be more accurate to say, quote, better listeners are better sellers, uh, would would it be more accurate to say better listeners and better sellers, and that gender is correlation, not causation? So I think you've said your piece there, Victor. I think you've been very fair. Think, you've you've said and chatted with me what you posted publicly on the mm -hmm. on the LinkedIn article that we will include in the show notes over this week in sales. Anything else you want to add to that, mate? No, like I said, I I, I was I was taken aback by how too many people were just just 
over the top celebrating this data point. I'm like, is anybody critically thinking about what this thing is really saying? You know, you articulated in two, three minutes what was going through my head, all the different, well, wait a minute, what about this? What about that? What about that? And I think it, it, it irritated me that we, this is LinkedIn. I guess I'm expecting a higher level of cognitive display as opposed to emotional display. And really, you know, because this is how you provide feedback, am I right? And this is, by the way, we're not beating up on Gong. We're saying, I don't know. Is that the full picture? Is that the complete picture? We're saying, I don't think so. And that's all. And I, I just, I was shocked by, I was taken aback by how many people just kind of said, oh, wow, this is great. Women power. You know, I'll, you know, I'm like, wait a minute, wait, wait, look at the data. But anyway, I'll end it on that. And, and final but, thing I will end this on, this is on Gong's LinkedIn page. It was written by Devin. This isn't on Devin's own LinkedIn profile, where perhaps he could have collated some of this data himself and put his own article out. This is a corporate piece, right? That this is a corporate piece of content. Yeah. So I feel like the standards, whether it's on LinkedIn or their own blog, is different to an individual posting this. Got it. I, I'll accept that. Cool. Right. Well, anything else to add before we wrap up? No, I uh, just want to remind people, uh, in June, if I may promote this, uh, we have the Outbound Conference in here in Atlanta, Georgia. So to go, uh, go to outboundconference.com. You got Jeb Blunt, Mark, uh, Mark Hunter, Anthony Norino, you know, guys, and a bunch of new speakers. It's a great event. It was canceled last year. It's going forward this year. And yes, yours truly will be there. Amazing stuff. And for anyone who isn't familiar with those individuals, they've all been, uh, other than Jeb, have been on my podcast. We've talked about this offer. We need to get a job on my show. So have a chat. A sales legends. I call Victor sales legends. This is like the A team of sales trainers, mm -hmm. especially in this modern uh, environment that we're living in, in the virtual world. Almost all of you have got a book essentially on virtual selling, AI, uh, all the, the the modern spin on the sales process. This is new school. This is this is powerful stuff. If it was more local, Victor, I'd be there myself, my friend. Hey, man, you're welcome to come, man. I'll, I'll, you know, Will, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to put this on the air. If you come, I will comp you. You don't have to pay to get in. You just have to find your way over here. How's that? I just need three weeks quarantine, <laughs> a five grand flight, and then hotels, and then probably the, the whiskey bill to keep up with you lot yeah. after the fact, right? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I'm just putting it out there. Well, I'm just trying to be nice here. I'm no, nice. it's something that we're going to be doing uh, probably next year, 2022, uh, a lot more traveling. So me and you will meet up then for some whiskeys and uh, some good chats and some uh, more probably X-rated sales content after the fact. And with that, Victor, and for the audience, I've got to go because I'm already a minute late for another conversation. So I'll wrap things up there. That was This Week in Sales. That is Victor Antonio, sales legend. My name is Will Barron, founder over at salesman.org. And we'll speak with you next week on This Week in Sales.